long enough for this new video, but for now, let's get right into it, and we'll go ahead and start off where we left off. So, Carlsbad Caverns, sculpture beneath the desert. Every sunset on summer evenings in a corner of the Guadalupe Mountains in southern New Mexico, a dark cloud swirls out of the ground. What looks like a tornado is actually half a million bats flying out of an immense opening in the earth. The bats fan out over an area a hundred miles wide, catching and devouring flying insects. At dawn, they return to their home. This nightly exodus of Mexican free-tailed bats led to the modern rediscovery of Carlsbad Caverns around 1900. This great cave is one of the largest caverns in the world. The size and boldness of its huge vaulted underground chambers are truly awesome. The cave contains formations of such startling shapes and colors and of such monumental proportions that country humorist Will Rogers called this underground wonderland the Grand Canyon with a roof on it. People have known about these spectacular caverns for thousands of years. According to archaeological evidence, nomadic hunters and gatherers use the cave's enormous mouth for shelter. used to affix names to the caverns rock formations, but rangers have removed 
next, the Channel Islands, American Galapagos. The Channel Islands jut up from the Pacific Ocean near the town of Santa Barbara in Southern California. The eight offshore islands, five of which make up this unique national park, have always been intriguing. In the past, access was limited. This gave the islands an air of mystery that was compounded by the fact that on some days the weather causes them to disappear altogether, only to re reappear later like distant mountains floating on a sea of clouds. The four largest and northernmost islands, San, Mi San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, and Anacapa, are two to five miles apart. They are strong like great peaks of a mountain range lost long ago to the relentless sea. It takes little imagination to picture their bases on the seafloor, surrounded by foothills and valleys. The islands are volcanic remnants of an ancient mountain range that was once the western extension of the Santa Monica Mountains. Today, only the eroded peaks rise above the ocean, but the islands were formed by the same geologic upheaval that created the mountains on the mainland. About half a million years ago, violent and extensive earthquakes gradually separated the islands from the mainland. Over time, wind and water eroded them down to the outcroppings of today. Always a sanctuary for unusual plants and animals, the islands were inhabited as early as 30,000 years ago by people who left behind a cooking pit that still contains the burned bones of a small mammoth. How people and mammoths got to the islands remains a mystery. On Santa Cruz Island, there are also remnants of villages built by later inhabitants. More recently, the Chumash lived there. They went to sea in long blank canoes, caulked with tar from oil seeps, to fish and hunt for seals, whales, and sea otters. Their peaceful existence was shattered by the arrival of the Spanish explorer Juan Rodriguez Cabril, who landed on San Miguel Island in 1542. The Spanish hired the native people to hunt sea otters for their pelts. Over time, the Spanish brought other people to the islands to help with the hunt. They warred against the Chumash, finally driving them to the mainland. Sea otters were hunted almost to extinction to satisfy the booming European fur business. Recently, they have begun thriving again on the Channel Islands, which today are a refuge for wildlife and plants found nowhere else. Beaches, rocky harbors, and inlets provide a habitat for such exotic creatures as the northern elephant seal, which can weigh up to three tons and wriggles up sandy beaches on its belly. An equally familiar sight is the thousands of California sea lions that return to San Miguel each year to mate, give birth, and rear their young. The islands also accommodate sea otters, northern fur seals, and all kinds of nesting seabirds. A marine sanctuary extends over six nautical miles around each island, protecting a giant kelp forest that provides habitat for nearly a thousand species of fish and many unusual marine plants. Each December, great gray whales stop by the islands to feed on the bountiful sea life. Anacapa. Arch rock rises 40 feet above the sea, hollowed out for eons by wind and water. It makes a spectacular entrance to Anacapa Island for visitors who have made the 90-minute journey by motor launch from the mainland. The formation was once part of the rocky island, but now it stands offshore as a dramatic, delicate arch. After climbing up 154 steps from the landing platform, visitors can stroll along a one-and-a-half-mile nature trail on their own and to, or join a park ranger for a guided tour that reveals a lot of island lore. In many ways, Anacapa is a microcosm of the Channel Islands. Making a home here are such unusual plants as the tree sunflower, which bursts into a rich golden color in autumn. In spring and summer, thousands of wildflowers bloom here, despite the dearth of fresh water on the island. Elsewhere, there are the remnants of a chumash midden used for cooking. In spring, thousands of seabirds, such as petrels and oyster catchers, nest on the island's rocky cliffs high above the sea. On fine days, the nature trail offers outstanding views of the mainland from its vantage point on the cliffs more than 140 feet above the sea. Channel Islands National Park was established in 1980 and is located on the coast of California. Access is subject to weather conditions. The size is 249,354 acres, and the terrain includes rocky islands with valleys, meadows, and dunes. Highlights are Arch Rock 
because of the suddenness with which it presents itself. In much the same way that the area around the Grand Canyon does not prepare you for its magnificence, the terrain surrounding Crater Lake seems an unlikely location for such a large body of water. You approach the lake on a road that rises gradually through twists and turns up the side of a mountain clothed in forests of Shasta red fir, hemlock, and pine. Suddenly the road comes over a rise and plunges downward into a great basin, and there is the lake. At first, you can hardly believe that you are seeing 25 square miles of water so blue that it looks like India 
places are as forbidding or as beautiful as Death Valley National Park. Sprawling across 3.3 million acres of the Mojave Desert, the park is almost completely surrounded by mountains. To the east, the bare walls of the Amargosa Range rise steeply from the desert floor, forming the sawtooth peaks of the Grapevine, Funeral, and Black Mountains. The range is creased by dozens of deeply eroded canyons, exposing layers of pastel-colored sediments deposited millions of years ago by a series of ancient seas. To the west, the Panamint Range rises to some 11,000 feet and is peppered with the ruins of mining camps, where prospectors once searched for gold, silver, and later, borax. The mountains and canyons are still cross-hatched by old mining roads, many of them now used as hiking or four-wheel drive trails. This is a harsh and unforgiving land, less than two inches of rain fall annually, much of it in brief showers that may last only a few minutes. Summer temperatures regularly. <clears throat> Summer temperatures routinely soar above 110 degrees, while winter temperatures commonly dip below freezing. Expecting a heat scorched desert, first time visitors are often surprised to see a dusting of snow atop the highest peaks as late as March or April, when the weather on the valley floor is already quite balmy. The park's topography is equally dramatic. Elevation changes from sea level near bowed water, the lowest place in the western hemisphere, to 11,049 feet at Telescope Peak, where ancient bristlecone pines may be as much as 300 or 400 years old. Between the mountains and the valley, between the mountains is the valley itself, about 200 miles long and as much as 16 miles across. Here, sand dunes are sculpted into ever-changing shapes by the ceaseless action of the wind. Salt flats shimmer in the heat and knobby crystal formations, such as those of the Devil's Golf Course, sparkle in the sunshine. On the west side of the park, the 5,475-foot peak at Dante's View overlooks the vast expanse of the valley, with its white salt sinks and scattered mesquite hummocks. Nearby, Zabriskie Point overlooks an area known as the Badlands, a broken landscape of gullies and ridges that have been gouged out of the earth by erosion. To the north, on a dried lake bed known as Racetrack Valley, rocks leave mysterious trails across a sun-baked playa. Geologists speculate that they have been blown by powerful winds across a thin layer of ice or slippery mud. Some 30 miles away, Yubehibe Crater was blasted out of the earth's surface by a volcanic eruption about 3,000 years ago. Nearby is Scotty's Castle, a lavish Spanish-style mansion built in the 1920s by Chicago millionaire Albert M. Johnson and his companion, a desert rat named Walter Scott, better known as Death Valley Scotty. Death Valley was christened by a party of travelers who, in 1849, made a disastrous shortcut across the region to the California gold fields. Before departing, the survivors cursed the valley and gave it a name. We took off our hats, and then, overlooking the scene of so much travail, suffering, and death, spoke the thought uppermost in our minds, saying a goodbye, Death Valley. Today, visitors will find Death Valley much more hospitable. Scotty's Castle Death Valley may seem an unlikely place for a castle. Castle, a $2 million 25 room fairy tale palace nestled.
the summit in May or early June because after that, avalanches threaten. Most climbers take a ski plane to the 7,500 level of the Cahilvnas Glacier, so to begin the 10 to 20 day trek. Grizzly bears are the undisputed sovereigns of this wild terrain. They roam the park at will, feeding mainly on roots, berries, and other plants. When they are ravenously hungry, instance, after a winter's hibernation, the bears may also go after arctic ground squirrels, injured caribou, or moose calves. On a summer day, when there is up to 24 hours of sunlight, visitors to Denali see sights they will remember the rest of their lives. A huge herd of caribou migrates through a pass below Mount McKinley, heading toward its summer feeding grounds. On a green meadow in, on Primrose Ridge, a band of two dozen pure white tall sheep pause briefly as they make their to the high alpine crags where they prefer to spend their summers. A golden eagle soars off a cliff along polygrome pass on the park road, while the eerie call of a loon rolls across Wonder Lake. At the same time, a grizzly takes time out to stretch and survey the surroundings while munching berries on Sable Pass, just as the clouds part to reveal the awesome bulk of Mount McKinley for one magic exploring Denali. In a park as vast as this, the opportunities for exploring are practically endless. Most visitors begin by taking the park or bus on the 85-mile gravel road that extends deep into the Denali wilderness. From the visitor center on the eastern boundary of the park, the bus climbs out of a stunted spruce forest onto the treeless tundra that rolls through valleys and over gentle ridges to the flanks of Mount Offering stunning vistas of the Alaska Range along the way, the road winds along Primrose Ridge, then drops into marshy flats in the so-called drunken forest of spruce trees that lean every which way. The trees slant because of the ground's yearly freezing and thawing cycles. After crossing three passes, the road finally reaches the Eelson Visitor Center at mile 66, a rest stop frequented frequented by ground squirrels and even an occasional grizzly. After passing within a mile of the great snout of the Muldrow Glacier, the road comes to its terminus at the Wonder Lake campground. The view is magnificent. If the weather cooperates, you can see the sheer Wickersham Wall, McKinley's north face, which rises for more than 14,000 feet and is one of the most awesome mountain walls in the world. Denali National Park was established in 1917 and is open all year, although late May to mid-September is the main season. The size is 6,000. No, oh my gosh, wait, I read that wrong again. The size is 6,500,000 acres. Okay, so automatically that beat out the last one we just went over. That just, went, that just beat out Death Valley by twice as much. I should have known. As soon as I said that, I was like, okay, but Alaska though, I should have known. The terrain includes mountains, tundra, valleys, and lakes, and highlights include Mount McKinley and Wickersham Wall. Wildlife includes grizzly bears, moose, caribou, tall sheep, wolves, foxes, golden eagles, loons, wolverines, marmots, beacus, small mammals, and birds. Activities include ranger-led walks, hikes, children's programs, sled dog demonstrations, slideshows, and films, bus tours, hiking, fishing, cross-country skiing, mountain climbing, and backpacking. Services include three visitor centers, three lodges, cabins, and seven campgrounds. And when we start next time, we are going to be coming to the Dry Tortugas. Dry Tortugas, but for now, thank you for joining me. I hope to never have three weeks between videos again weeks, I guess. But thank you for sticking around. Thank you for being patient with me. And uh, I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this video. And yeah, I look forward to doing this again and seeing you guys next time. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know through likes or comments. And if you would subscribe,